Greetings my friends and welcome to a brand new Nations Guide. Now, those of you who've been of long time uh, on my channel, you will notice that we are now in the Ottoman Empire. Now I have an Ottoman Empire campaign going at the, currently at my own Ottoman campaign going at the moment, but I have had a couple of requests, a number of requests actually, more so than any other nation, that we look at a Nations Guide for the Ottoman Empire. Now I am going to bring back my Ottoman Empire campaign in the near future, just as a little side note, but today we're going to focus on those of you who may be interested in starting the Ottoman Empire and we're going to be looking at, of course, the usual. We're going to be looking at what you start with, the region you start with, the topography of the land, we're going to be looking at the resources you have, both uh, social and also sort of industrial and economic. Um, we're going to be looking at your enemies, your allies, um, what, what your future plans are, and we're also be looking at um, effectively what the o o how you can manage the Ottoman Empire because when I say the Ottoman Empire is of the larger empires you start with not 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 because although you can get you can you you do have singular sort of nations as it were that are incredibly tough campaigns the the larger campaign the larger sort of empires you start with the Ottoman Empire is by far the most difficult. I would say. Now, I know there are others that might argue that you know, some other nations might be more difficult to start with, those that are, say, a bit, little bit larger than a single nation. But by, you know, by certain measures, the Ottoman Empire is incredibly difficult to really, really get, you know, really, really get your foot in the door and really hit the ground running fast because of where you are and what you start with. Now we will go, we'll go deeper into this. And although you can say, well man, how can you possibly say that? Look at the sun, look at the land mass. Look at the size of the Ottoman Empire. It quite clearly is not going to be a hard campaign. Mark my words, my friends. Never judge a book by its covers. This looks like it's going to be an easy campaign because of the size. And you probably think you've got lots of money, so you've got lots and lots of money coming in. Look at all this, all this trade flowing through. Nothing be further from the truth. It really is an incredibly difficult campaign. And the primary reason of that is the weakness of the Ottoman of the Ottoman Empire is it doesn't have the depth in technology to start with. It doesn't have the troops, it doesn't have the the, the, sh the sheer quality of the sort of the Western Empire of the Western um empires and indeed sort of the Russian empires were looking for the east. Now we're going to delve a little bit deeper into that but mark my words my friends this is not an e on the surface it looks like you're going to just steamroll everybody because you've just got this huge huge empire that goes from Cairo all the way here into Moldova here or, you know broaching into sort of central Europe as well and even into the west here in Bosnia and Serbia but believe me, my friends this is an incredibly incredibly difficult campaign, especially if you are a, a sort of a, a beginner at, at Empire Total War, don't be lulled into full sense of security of the size of the nation. It will be a real task, believe me. Um, so let's begin and let's look at what you start out with. As, uh, as I was just saying, you've got Bosnia and Moldova, you've got Serbia, Moldova. Now that's just sort of your front line here, the west here, of course, you've got Transylvania here, which is, as you can see, Austria. Now Austria is going to be your nearest neighbour to start with. As you can see, they are a decent sized empire themselves they of course have the benefit there of the western technologies and they've also got that sort of ability to produce quality troops now that's not to say the ottoman empire can't do that later on in the future in in, in the in sort of the future but right now the ottoman empire lags far far behind unfortunately the western the western sort of and indeed the russian empire as well but let's have a look a closer look at what you really get to start with. So you've got you've got the sort of the Middle East is firmly under your control for now. So you've got uh, Armenia, then you move into Baghdad, Syria, to Palestine, G Egypt. You know, moving into sort of Turkey, Ankara, and Istanbul, latter day Turkey as it is now. And you can see you've, you've got these huge vast cities here, as you can see. But look at this. As I was saying, you don't really start off with a huge amount. They don't have any provincial barracks here. You've got a cannon foundry, which of course the cannons really are the, sort of the hallmark of the Ottoman Empire. You're looking at, at the at the pinnacle of their cannons. You're looking at 64 pounders, which are an absolute brute. They really are a phenomenal phenomenal. And also the organ gun, as you can see there in that list there, the organ gun is an absolute beautiful piece of artillery. It really can. It does huge damage. It really really does. But again. You you can't uh, the, the quantity you have to pick the armies that these pieces of gun these sort of pieces of cannon go into because you don't get a huge amount of them. 
So we're just going to look at the, the sort of the overall, quickly brief look at overall of the different aspects here. So you can see you don't get a lot to start with. You've got the governor's residence, of course, which you can move into here. Infrastructure is basic roads. So you have to think an empire of this size, infrastructure would be key, and that was one of the main things you must start with, my friends. Infrastructure is so vital, it really is. Getting the roads up to scratch, even just getting cobbled roads, will make a huge difference. Because you want that trade you've got, you've got this massive empire with the, uh, the ability to trade with every single nation, and you've got vast resources. But if they're going to be hindered by a poor infrastructure, you're going to really feel it, my friends. Believe me, you're going to be penny pinching for a long, long time to make ends meet, as it were. And of course, then you've got the ports here as well. You've got this port here in Syria, Beirut here in Syria, bringing in quite a lot here. One well, of your main trade routes here. You've even got the option here, the local fishery, of course, and you're looking at Jerusalem, the same thing. Look at this done in the cannon foundry. It's only got the very, very basics. The infrastructure, again, is only basic roads. As you can see, you can only get cobbled roads here. You can't upgrade any further past cobbled roads. You can't upgrade to that sort of that sort of the, almost, almost the sort of the the, the, the next so almost like the paved roads. You can't even upgrade here in, in in the Middle East to that for some reason. You can see cobbled roads. That'd be a, that's the most you can get. But even that is going to significantly boost your income. Look at that, plus four per, per turn town wealth in the region improves campaign movement speed which is absolutely vital particularly in these areas where there's huge distances between each location as you can see uh, obviously these these two the Jerusalem and Damascus are close but even Egypt is, is quite far away from Jerusalem Baghdad is the absolute stands on its own here so again the roads are going to be crucial they really really are as you can see you've got the road running along here the ribbon system here and that really is the Tigris here, you've got this sort of... But look, even then, you've got the Ottoman and Mughal Empire here again. Look at that, you've got this ability to have a huge income from a, a sort of a, a, another large, huge nation here, the Mughal Empire, flowing through here, through the port here in Basra. But again, if the roads leading from the port to the, the capital aren't of of good quality, it's going to affect the trade again. You've only got basic roads, so the trade here, you know, you're going to get you're going to get a good increase. Maybe even go to 2,000 from the Mughal Empire if you get big decent roads. And of course, you've got a, a huge plethora of buildings to choose from an upgrade carpet weaver. And again, here you've got the sort of the madrasa here, which will help definitely with. Uh, the population and conversion and also giving you agents as well religious agents but again you're going to have to decide how you where you want your nation to go are you going to sort of maybe only keep a few madras a few religious buildings and then convert the others into economic powerhouses to really drive the economy because if the Ottoman economy is firing on all cylinders it is going to be formidable mark my words my friends it's going to be absolutely formidable it really is because the internal the internal potential of the Ottoman Empire is vast. As you can see here again, you've got the carp carpet weaver's cottage. Again, bringing 562 in, plus 10 per turn. The same here to this one here as well. 450 plus 10 as well, but all, all the time adding wealth, adding regional wealth. The regional wealth then feeds into the larger pot of the national wealth. As you can see, look, you've got iron workshop, plus 600 plus 8 here. Another madrasa here. And again, you've got another iron workshop here at plus 750. So you can see the potential for this for the Ottoman Empire is huge. Now, of course, out here on the by itself here in, Ar in Armenia, again, look at the armies here. Look at the infrastructure. Nothing. They don't even have basic roads here in Armenia. They don't even have roads in Armenia. That's what I'm, that's what I mean, my friends. You're going to have to go through each region with a fine toothpick to really sort of sort of get yourself and in your own mind have a plan of what you want, where you want your sort of strength to lie because you can't you can't really have st strength and depth in Armenia but you could in Baghdad you could this Baghdad could be a powerhouse for the sort of for this region here so could a Ankara but uh, is Armenia going to be a powerhouse? No because the, the scope for expansion is limited you don't have a huge amount of exp expansion here even obviously even if you were to get rid of the governors residence here but again if you were upgrade to this look at the troops you get in the region that the risk of souls which I will touch on later are absolute monsters uh, in battle they really are but again if you upgrade to the governor's residence you're going to be able to get some some 
quite decent units here. So again, Armenia would be your sort of your vanguard here, again defending against what is to come. Because Russia is also your war with Russia, as you can see here, and also at peace with the Persians for now. But how long will that last? Who knows? Again, you've got Ankara here again. Now that does have some potential to move into barracks and the Janissaries here, of course. Which are which are a, a fine troop, lots and lots of melee troops, pikemen, fellahin, uh, azars, which azars are actually very good. You've got the kind of zamindari horsemen as well. Then you move into sort of start moving into sort of the the bridge between east and west. You've got Istanbul here, and you can look at it. The cent Istanbul really is going to be the powerhouse, the absolute pinnacle, as you can see the high port here, which you've almost got here. Look at that, plus 18% for regional income. Huge bonus for research. Recruitment, you get additional three units here as well for that. Again, not a massive amount of troops, but again, that's not what you need here for. But to go to drill school, if you've always got a barracks already, look what you get from a drill school. Musketeers, Mamluks, even the option to get Royal Mamluk Guards eventually when you get wedge formation. You've even got uh, Sekban Janus Janissaries, even the Janissary Grenadiers. So again, as you can see, once you really get the, the Ottoman Empire firing on all cylinders, it is a formidable, and it can be a formidable force, but you don't have many centers like Istanbul. That's a problem. To get to that stage, you're going to have to invest a huge amount of money in, and that's where you really want to sort of focus on. But the powerhouse, the absolute powerhouse of the... Ottoman Empire. If excuse any noise in the background, my friends, you can probably gather who might have just woken up. But the powerhouse of the Ottoman Empire is the West. These Western regions here have the potential to be massive, absolutely huge powerhouses for the economy. They really, really do. And that is why we, you need to focus on those as quickly as you possibly can. As you can see, look, even here, just in Greece alone, You've got the ability here to really upgrade a huge amount of plus 187 for a tenant and farm reduces food shortages, even increases po population growth. This iron workshop here is already going to produce more than most wood further east in the, in the, in the, in the cat. Look at this, even here, vineyards plus 300. So already you're seeing a huge amount of income. Now, Athens itself can be a huge powerhouse as well if it's converted into that. Again, the infrastructure is only basic roads. You don't have those cobble roads yet. Doesn't have any the ability to go any further than that. Same cobble roads, and that's all you're going to get really. Big. But even that upgrade was going to be a huge, huge difference to this. Look at the power. Look at the, the infrastructure here. You're going to upgrade to mines. Yeah, it's iron mine, which isn't even hasn't even been built yet. Plus 700 regional wealth for a thousand gold. Absolutely fantastic. The same here, you've got farms you can upgrade. You've got, again here, look, the farms haven't been even cre even been built yet. You've got another iron mine down here, another 700 to regional wealth. So if you, in, if you were to invest in these, the, the ability to produce and to really maximize the potential of this is phenomenal. It really, really is, my friends. It really, really is. So as I was saying, my friends, you've got a huge potential here for the West. Now, as you can see, you've got the forts here as well. Now, as you can see, we start to see here, we can start to sort of delve in. The armies here on the West, and indeed anywhere, are not of the finest calibre. Let's be absolutely honest here. Now, there's a lot of them. You can see here, look at that. That's 350 troops just in three regiments. That's a huge amount. But then look at the morale, look at what they're able to do. They're not of the finest. And the, the defense, the melee defense is actually quite high here. But the caliber of the troops is not of the same as the opponents you're going to be facing, particularly in the West here, particularly against Hungary. Hungary is going to be your main sort of arch enemy, as it were, to start with. And also, you've also got Russia here just across the way here. They've got your peace with Poland. You ally with the Crimean Carnate here, but they are a similar vein as you can see, but even they have some excellent units here. These are units that you wouldn't mind being able to get out the Cossack infantry line, which is not too bad at all. As you can see, you've got a, a, a very good general down here as well. Delhi Horsemen, Muslim Mob, you've got Azars, and you've also got the Bashi Bazooks here, which are actually very, very good, particularly in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But again, you're not looking at that 
but a very very powerful force, huge forces. And with Istanbul being the sort of the main powerhouse in so sort of the that can feed the West. Look at the distance you have to travel, the troops have to travel to get to the front lines. Huge distances here. So it's the planning is gonna be absolutely crucial. Of course you've got Athens here and you could of course send troops via ship into the ports here, Ragusa. Sort of start feeding troops in from Bosnia into Serbia, etc., and sort of spreading that the these sort of the troop movements that way. But the pressures on the Ottoman Empire are going to be huge, and they're going to be coming a lot, my friends. Believe me, as you can see here, and even in Greece, you get the barracks, of course, here, and then get the Janissaries, uh, you get the Falahin, the Israelis as well. You've got the Samandari horsemen. Again, cannon foundries, which are going to be definitely. You get organ gun. Organ gun really is going to be a, a huge feather in your cap. Uh, recruitment, of course, is limited to what you've just seen here. So again, getting your infrastructure up, getting your recruitment up, getting these buildings up as quickly as possible is going to be absolutely key. Now, personally, I would focus on the main centre to start with. So I would definitely be looking at getting some of these, up, especially this Grand Admiralty now as well. As you can see, getting the research up here. You've already got an ordnance factory here, which is going to give you 18 pounders, demi cannons. 18. Now you're already way ahead. This is the, both the only field the Ottoman Empire is ahead of the Western and uh, other larger empires is in its cannon and ordnance. 18 pounders to start with you can already recruit, you can already get, which is an almost unheard of. It really, really is. You can see here, look at that. Absolutely phenomenal to get an 18 pounder st straight off the bat as soon as you start. Incredible, it really, really is. So again, you're looking to use every advantage. The, the Ottomans have a fantastic of can cannon ordnance facilities, they really really look at that, 18 pounders there for the ordnance factory here barracks, getting the barracks up in these principal locations is going to be absolutely key and again getting these ports, you've got a shipyard here as you can see you can't really get these massive sort of ships you you would normally get from the, from the having a dockyard and that, but you can still get some good ships here, 4th rate, admirals 5th rate you can get the bomb catch eventually, you've even got the fifth rate down here as well, so again, you can get some decent ships if you invest in them, but the empire is so vast, you have to choose where you're going to spend your money to, because even Limassol here is a, fi a, a fishing, so local fishery here, getting the fisheries up is going to be important as well, you're going to need to feed your population, and you've got a vast population to feed as well, so it's going to be important that you spread that, the ability to feed your nation, but also to protect it and to gain. So now that we can see the so the infrastructure and the, the, the problem in terms of getting the empire up to scratch, you've got a huge amount of investment to do. Let's have a look at sort of a little bit in more in depth, you know, you start off with 7,500 gold, which of course is not very much considering the size of your empire. Now, as you can see, let's have a look at the, so the diplomacy here, this is going to be absolutely key. As you can see, you've got a huge amount of trade potential here. Huge amount of trade potential. Well, look at this. A lot of unfriendly, indifferent, unfriendly, hostile. Now, there's one reason for that, and the reason is your protectorate's here. Your protectorate of the Barbary states, they are at war with everybody. So, as you can see down here, the Barbary states here is effectively a pirate nation. There's no other words to put it. They go from Algiers all the way to Tripoli here. And of course, they raid and harass and harangue all the other nations' fleets, trade lines you are their protectorate and that is why you have most if not all of the nations of the world against you in some way look under none, very few are friendly crime and currently are friendly, friendly because you're a protectorate and the same here because of those but there's there's no one no one else here who is friendly with you look every single one is indifferent and friendly hostile because you have the Barbary states as a protectorate also have the Crimean Carnate as a protectorate now the Crimean, Crimean Carnate is not as bad but the Barbary state is the absolute Achilles heel of the Ottoman Empire. Now, personally, when I in, during my campaign, I cut ties with Barbary, Barbary states if, pretty much immediately to try and get the to try and get the di diplomatic sort of status up and running because you're really going to need it. You really are. Even the Mughal Empire is indifferent to you, and they're they're at minus twenty as well. So you can see even with the, the vast trade coming in from the two. That's the reason why the Marathan Confederacy is the same. As you can see, a lot of the Western emperors of Sweden is friendly towards you because you've had a sort of a historical friendship, as it were. But they're about the only nation, apart from the two protectorates, that are friendly towards you. 
everybody else is either unfriendly, indifferent, or hostile towards you. And primarily the reason is because of the Barbary state. Now, there's another reason as well, which we'll go into soon. But if it was me personally, my personal advice was cut the ties with these as soon as you possibly could. Look at that, they're at war with every single nation effectively in the world. And that's the why, reason why your, bar the, your diploma diplomatic status is absolutely horrific. Now, of course, you can go in here and you can cancel your alliance with them. You can drop them as a protectorate. That would be my absolute first thing to do, is cancel the alliance with them. Just have a trade agreement. If you want them to have a trade agreement, with them, leave the trade agreement in place. Have the military access in place, but drop the protectorate. Drop the alliance with them. That will help a huge amount. It really, really will. Again, the Crimean Carnates are not too bad at all. So, they're at war with the pirates, which is obviously, and then the Russia of, of game because the Russia wants the Crimean Carnate for itself. But again, these are not too bad. These are sort of the um, sort of an an outpost, as it were, of the Ottoman Empire in by a de facto default outpost, as it were. They can help them to build up. But to be honest with you, if Russia takes over the Crimean Carnate. It's not going to be a huge thing. It, strategically, though, it could be a problem because it gives them this peninsula here, which they, means they can strike down into Anatolia and Istanbul, and they can sort of then use this the, any trade, any ports coming from this region, then to run through into from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. That's going to cause a lot of problems. So perhaps enabling the Crimean Khan to build up quite strong would be in your advantage to hold off the Russians for as long as possible. But again. This is not at the start of it, the start of your campaign. This is not really going to be an issue for you to really dig into. You can have a lot of other things to sort out for yourself. Anyways, it is. Now, following on from that, we can have a look at our research. Now, we've only got one research centre here in Konya here, which is in the Anatolia. Now, remember when I was saying my friend, my former friends, when we got madrasas. Some of those madrasas may have to be sacrificed in terms of building your <coughs> research and development up because that's going to be absolutely crucial getting as much research and development up and running as quickly as possible is going to be cr key here because you don't although you already start with cannons shot and improved grenades which is really really useful and you, go, you can already go down explosive shell already to open up the great arsenal <coughs> which is going to give you 24 pounders probably before any other nation <coughs> you're going to get 24 pounders if you go down that route faster than any other nation, that's going to be huge because the cannon is really going to be the backbone of your army. But again, as you can see, plus bayonets here, they're going to give you Royal Cairo Infantry Guards and African Infantry Guards, and that's going to be already a huge boost to your regiments. Look at this. Already they are vastly superior to what you already have. So again, just going down that singular route of getting a plug bane that's going to be massive. Carbines, that's going to give you, look at that, mounted Nizam, Sedit and Delhi Horseman. Then of course you've got the square formation, which of course is going to give you plus two upkeep to cost for infantry, so that's already going to cost you more. <coughs> but again, you don't, I mean, square formation is a hugely defensive, hugely important formation to have, especially against the cavalry. Um, then you've got ring bayonets, of course, if you go down to a wedge, you can get the Royal Mamelukes. Look at these here. That is absolutely the morale is high, good charge bonus, good attack, fantastic defence. They really are absolutely fantastic, the Royal Mameluke Guards. And of course then, really is European Doctrine. That's going to be huge, because as you can see, it takes 36 turns, so it takes a huge amount of time. But look what you can get out of it. Mounted Dizam, Sek Ban Janissary Rifleman, Look at the accuracy, 66. Okay, I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. And you've got the Nizam Light Infantry. You've got then the nice, nice set of rifles, which are effectively sort of like a European-based unit. And then you've got the Nizam Set It Infantry. Look at that. So again, this these here would then eventually form the backbone, the core of your armies. But it's getting there is going to take a huge amount of time. Because the research on that is 36 turns, unless you get a gentleman... And unless you start really opening up some other bases of research and development, preferably in Istanbul, preferably some more maybe in um, in Anatolia again, so having two schools in Anatolia, um, and definitely getting your arsenals up here as, as, as quickly as possible. Look at that, 64 pounder is the ultimate goal here. Look at that, the range is a thousand. 
it can effectively cover the entire battlefield absolutely incredibly accuracy is not that high but when you've got the gun of this magnitude one hit from that is going to cause huge damage so again getting getting these here and of course the drill school as you can see starts to improve the military academy starts to unlock then the royal janissary infantry guards look at that the cairo janissaries the general's bodyguard all of these things are opening look at that the libyan kalugru Palestinian auxiliaries, all of these are good, decent units. They really are. Start look at this. Hindu musketeers. It's all pretty up. Look at that. Janissary hand mortars of the Boluk are absolutely phenomenal. You get if you manage to get some of these units up close and personal to some of the your regiments, they will absolutely decimate anything in their path. They're absolutely fantastic. They really, really are. I can vouch for those personally. And of course, then you can have the absolute epitome of there are, there is a unit, let me see if I can find it here, there is a unit that I think you can already get already but it will not break, we've got the army visor, army visor right here, as you can see getting echelons here, look at that, it's a pious, absolutely the core here, they're the armoured heavy cavalry, look at the charge bonus, 23, look at the defence, 18, you start to really, start to build up a, a huge amount of choice and selection. Look at that, Sikh warriors. And then down here, Army Staff College. Look at that. So Cassian Armoured Cavalry, look at that. Absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely some one, look at that. These really are some phenomenal, phenomenal units you can get as you get further down the tree. If I'm not mistaken, can you recruit? There they are. There they are. These gentlemen here, you can only recruit a few of them. You can only recruit six of these units here, but these gentlemen do not break. Look at the morale 14, they're effectively unbreakable. They fight to the very, very last man. They do not They do not buckle, they do not bend. They're, they're, I think that's the highest morale of any unit but, but of, this, of this sort of, at this level when you start off. The, that's, the, that's the highest morale you can get of any unit when you first start anywhere. They are uh, virtually unbreakable. They will fight to the last man. These, in my campaign, I can vouch for them, have saved me a, a number of times. I, I think I had three regiments of these, and they effectively destroyed an entire flank of a fully fledged European army, i.e. Austrian army. It destroyed an entire flank and took pulled the battle around for me. I was almost on the verge of this defeat. I had them hidden in some undergrowth and they charged out at one of the flanks and they absolutely caved the flank in to the point where it was like a domino effect. Of all, the, you, all the Austrian units they went through just effectively collapsed and they fought down to the boat. There was like 10 men left and even then they didn't, buck, they didn't even break. It was incredible. So if you can put them in the right place and you can use them at the right time, the Riskers of Souls are absolutely better than possibly any other elite unit. That's how good they are. They're absolutely fantastic. They really are. And of course, you can get some fantastic units here. Fellow team Mesketeers. You can get some, as you can see here, the Mili Infantry, the Semat Genissaries, Fellaheen. Some of these units you get them hand to hand. They're phenomenal. You can get Organ Gun as well here, but only you can get two of them. That's what I mean. Using them is where you put these two units is going to be crucial to us. This army you put them in has to be an incredibly powerful army. Now, now we look at the research as you can see. I'm not sure. You can get the Imperial Naval Engineer School that drives up that there, but I don't think you can get admirals. You can get a first-rate admiral ship. Yes, you can get a first-rate ship of the line here. So you can actually go to that in this, but it's going to take a very, quite a long time, as you can possibly see here. And of course, going down these. You want to get the economy firing, so go and probably metal and textiles, and you get a lot of farms as well. So don't forget to use these as well. You know, moving down the, the scale here is absolutely crucial. But don't forget agriculture. Don't forget the sort of the the metal and the textile industries. That's just as important as the military and the ordnance and the naval. It really is. Then, of course, we delve deeper here. Now, that's that is a that is a good income. 5,542 is an excellent income. 
the army upkeeper is 4,170, which is huge for the army you've got. You've only got a very few units and you're already paying 4,000, so something is wrong there. Now, your trade income is pretty good here. You've got a lot of trade partners, Mughals, Venice, Crimea, Genoa and the Barbary States. You're at war with Russia, but I don't think that Austria would be far behind, to be honest with you. Depending on what level you are on, if you're on very, very, very hard, very hard, Austria will probably you come very, very quickly. Now, as you can see, you've got this Sultan here, Mustafa II. He's in Romalia. He's got minus one to management, minus one to prestige. Look at that, minus ten to diplomatic relations. Now, he is not a good Sultan at all. The only thing is an absolute monarchy, which means you're able to, you don't have to worry about sort of the democracy in terms of bringing different people in. You can actually decree something and it happens immediately. Now, that'll be, that'll be important here. Now, again, you can lower the tax rate to sort of increase the growth. As you can see here, the growth is already down. Look at that, minus down 135, down 120, down 800. You need to turn the economy around quickly. Now, lowering the tax level for the nobility would be one of those because you have that trickle-down effect where you're lowering it. So, eventually, over time, more wealth trickles in because people have more money to spend. The same could be said here for the lower class as well. Now, I know that's reducing that quite a bit, as you can see, to four, four, five, seven, zero. Oh, but it might that will increase, that will encourage growth if you lower the tax levels. People have got more money in their pockets. Now, ministers, this is absolutely crucial because look at this minus eight minus not plus minus eight bonus the global tax income for this gentleman here in other words he's got his hand in the till he is taking money for himself minus 30 bonus the growth in trade and minus 16 per turn to town wealth an absolutely horrific one of the worst ministers i've ever seen ever he he's he's taking more money out of the system putting in his own pocket. That's effectively what this is telling you. So you've got a lots of candidates here. Because you're an absolute monarchy, you can drop them in and out. Now, look at this gentleman here. Plus one to management, plus one management of army. Now, the army management isn't too bad, but if you were to drop him in there, you would see an immediate change here. Let's just try that. Look at that. The star's going to buy one. Look at this. Minus four to recruitment, plus four to technology research rate, minus four to upkeep costs. So straight away you've seen a huge benefit there, straight away. Now we do need to find somebody who, look at that, look at that, plus one to management for treasury. Do you have anybody else here who might be that? No. So this gentleman here would be perfect for the treasury. Let's see what happens if we put him in the treasury. Look at that, got a one star already, got plus one to global, global income tax, plus two to growth, plus two to town wealth and home theatre. That already is a huge improvement. This gentleman here, look at that, minus 10 diplomatic relations on top of the Sultan's minus 10. So that's why you're having struggling as well with diplomatic relations to everybody else. So again, you have to be looking for definite for somebody, pious and their jug head. I'd, I'd imagine this gentleman here would probably be better there in this position than anybody else. So look what happens. Yes, look at that. Already the prestige has gone to zero, so it means you've already sort of reset, you've already improved your relations straight away. Now, the Justice and the Navy aren't too bad, so you can probably wait for some more candidates to appear. But that is what you need to do. Trade, of course, you've got massive trade with the Mughal Empire. Barbary States, Venice, Genoa, Crimea incarnate, massive income here from from, tr from trade. That needs to stay open as long as possible. Lots of cotton. Ivory would probably be a huge boon if you get hold of that, but moving into the trade nodes, moving into the trade nodes here is going to be crucial. So moving this into the Madagascar Straits, moving into Ivory Coast, Getting, getting your ships onto these is going to be crucial because that's really going to boost your income tremendously. It really, really is. So all of these things, my friends, are on option now. Of course, enemies and allies. Enemies straight away. Austria is a key going to be, a, without a doubt, an enemy of yours. Unless you can somehow miraculously get them on side by maybe perhaps paying them money, perhaps giving one of these regions away to them. But even then, they'll still come after you because they want all of these regions back. Then Russia, of course, you're at war with Russia. That's, that's going to be a long, long war, particularly here in this sort of eastern part. Georgia can be a, a pretty good ally 
if you play your cards right. You've also got Persia here, which should be okay with you, as long as you keep a, a good diplomatic relations with them. And of course the Mughals, and indeed perhaps the depends who comes out on this particular war here on the subcontinent, the Mysoreans and also the, the Maratha Confederacy here, because you've got a huge trade with these gentlemen here. Now in the west, of course you've got Italy here and Spain across the Adriatic, Rome, Venice. God, we've already got trade with Venice, I believe. Yes, so Venice are going to be okay with you. Again, trade is going to be your key diplomatic tool. So keep getting that trade, keep that, keep upgrading your trade, keep the keep making sure that you've got these ports upgraded so that you've got massive amounts of trade going in and out so that every other country is getting trade from you is 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 feeling good from it. And of course, if you go against the Barbary states, you could swallow up all of North Africa for yourself. That would put you on the doorstep of Morocco and also Spain. And of course, perhaps being able to hold or even if you were able to crush in the Hungary, because Hungary will eventually come to war with Prussia and also with Poland as well. So it might not come to the point where you have to deal with Austria. They may collapse under the weight of other nations as well. But my friends, I hope you've enjoyed this nation's guide. And of course, building up your fleets as well is going to be very, very important as well. But I'm going to leave that in your capable hands, my friends. I hope you've, this guide has helped you sort of with the starters. If any of you have started this campaign or have done this campaign, please let me know how you got on. You know, in the comments below, let me know how you got on. But I'm going to leave this uh, guide here where it is now. I hope you've enjoyed this guide. It's, it's been a highly requested ca campaign guide. Many of you wanted to see. Hope you've enjoyed it, my friends. Whatever you're doing, please be safe, especially in these times. But until next time, bye for now.